So um, we're gonna we're gonna start by uh, sharing our screens real quick, just to make sure that uh, the system's working and that you know that you are on the right session. We're gonna be speaking about Hyperledger Indie in Aries and the spatial web for nested uh, accounting, nested climate accounting. Um, so if this is the presentation you're after, then you are in the right room. And uh, while we wait for people to uh, come into the presentation, I'll um, perhaps we start by doing a quick introduction of uh, myself and uh, David. My, um, my name is Martin Weinstein. I am the uh, founder and executive director of the Open Earth Foundation. We are a nonprofit uh, dedicated to the intersection of emerging digital technology and open source and open digital infrastructure, but with the very ambitious goal of working and thinking through planetary scale solutions to our most existential environmental challenges. Climate being, of course, a very important vertical on that, uh, but um, little by little also focusing on biodiversity. Um, I'm also the, uh, the founder and director of the Open Innovation Lab at Yale University. Uh, both Open Earth Foundation and uh, Yale Open Lab are members of the Hyperledger um, community. Uh, and if uh, you don't know about it, uh, there's the Hyperledger Climate Action and Accounting Special Interest Group, which I also founded uh, last year, and now it's led by some extremely active uh, and coordinated chairs. So I definitely engage that if you're interested in the intersection of hyper, uh, Hyperledger and climate, that you check out the special interest group. Um, and with that, I'll pass it on to David for his introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is David Thompson. I'm the director of integration at Versus, Versus.io. We have developed a core technology uh, in the networking, uh, computer networking space called the Hyperspatial Transaction Protocol along with the hyperspatial modeling language that we've partnered with the IEEE to standardize that we will be formally launching in July. And uh, one of the key applications and use cases that we've uh, been supporting and driving is uh, working very closely with, with Martin, uh, collaborating around uh, ne uh, nested car uh, climate accounting. So very, very excited to be here. And um, thank you all so much. Great, so um, I'll thank you, David. Uh, I'll kick it off by giving also some, some introduction for the run of show today. Um, I'll give a quick introduction to a project that we've been incubating both at Yale and the Open Earth Foundation called Open Climate. Um, highly ambitious uh, vision to create an integrated climate accounting system. Give some background knowledge on climate accounting for everyone to uh, wrap their head around it. Um, and then David, I'll pass it on to David to talk a bit about the spatial web and some backgrounds on how BIDs and verifiable credentials fall into that. Um, and we'll talk a bit about a, a prototype and pilot that we did last year and even mention some of the exciting uh, ongoing opportunities for this year. Uh, but really we're interested in creating a, a Q and A as, as, as we're always looking for establishing communities of collaboration. Um, and I'll start by showing a bit of the level of complexity when we started creating a framework for a, a, an integrative accounting system uh, at a, uh, now framed as Open Climate. And there's obviously a lot of moving parts, but, but, the, but the vision is to be able to have digital agreements and consensus in the flow of information between the state of the planet, Earth system state, that can relate specifically to the carbon budget, how much CO2 we can still put in the atmosphere before 1.5 degree uh, warming happens. What's the state of the world system registry? So how much are countries, subnational actors, non-state actors emitting and how, what's, what pledge did they make to do? How to certify climate actions, uh, whether that's emissions and uh, in, in a context that's often referred as MRV, monitor reporting and verification, Huge uh, important opportunity for the digitization of that and automation of that through IoT data uh, and smart contracts. And when one verifies emissions or mitigations or adaptation actions, that gets assetized properly if, uh, under this uh, protocol. And that asset, let's say tokenized uh, data information, can also be moved and traded. And so it moves into climate markets and all of that information needs to trickle into climate finance. By 2030, we should be pouring $4 trillion uh, of capital to be able to decarbonize our economy. So it's very important that we do this in a way 
that it's going to work because the stakes are so high that if we don't if we don't proper set up our digital systems to um, to align with this, we won't meet our climate goals. So, what is nested climate accounting? In 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 many ways, is uh, of course what it sounds. But uh, when I was talking about these assets of data, whether it's an emission or a mitigation, it could be units. Um, it's it's very relevant to uh, to think about the architecture of how non-state actors and uh, let's say such as corporations um, and subnational governments, their the way that they manage their carbon inventory could roll up to the national inventory. Um, this would simplify. Uh, but also help a connection between the non-state actors and state actors to be part of the Paris Agreement. At the international level, that's a big that's a big part of what what happens is the Paris Agreement is between countries and the UN. Um, but where do corporations and subnational governments fit in? So by creating jurisdictional boundaries, this is one of the things that we've been wanting to explore. And this has been a wicked problem for many years. Um, so what we present here is a bit of exploration last year and a lot of work ongoing to continue those efforts this year. The second part about open climate is the, the search for technology that helps us create interoperable climate units, a common language on how we talk about climate. Um, again, the climate unit could be either positive carbon, negative carbon, but there needs to be a methodology of how that was defined um, and even a certification of quality so that that could end up being as we know in accounting, either credits or debits. And when we talk about net zero, so let's say you know of a company that has a net zero goal, well, essentially that is an accounting uh, statement, right? Credits and bad debits must balance themselves. Um, and this has been a lot of the work that we've been looking at how to create that level of interoperability and trusted interactions to make these uh, visions possible. The third, Finally, uh, important architecture piece of, of, of the research is then when we have interoperability, when we have jurisdictional uh, context to this, can this help integrate climate markets? Uh, because the assets that I mentioned can uh, be moved around, can be traded. Um, and this is, of course, a hugely booming area. The voluntary carbon market world has grown a lot in the last couple of years um, so that emission reductions can happen in-house within an organization, but also uh, could be sourced elsewhere. So uh, hopefully that, that obviously there's a lot <laughs> there to unpack, but it's to give you a, a vision of, of open climate. Um, and if it, if you probably need a, a primer a bit of where this sits within the broader climate accounting world, I'll just uh, explain that what we will talk about today is mostly around carbon accounting, which means emissions and mitigation, but that's not all of accounting. Uh, adaptation measures, how organizations, individuals, and countries prepare for a global world, uh, how do we account for pledges and to create accountability towards those pledges, and then how much money we move around in the system. Those are very important climate relative accounting that don't relate to carbon. Um, in the market space, we have the voluntary carbon market. If you've ever tried to offset your flight, uh, that's normally where that, that lies. You are totally doing it on a voluntary basis. But there are compliance mechanisms that subnational actors have, such as renewable energy certificates for utilities, uh, national level, and international. Uh, the most important international uh, climate market is has been the Kyoto Protocol and uh, the clean development mechanism within it. Uh, but how does markets fit into the Paris Agreement? That also bit becomes very important. One of the things that we were looking at from a research standpoint is is how do we draft the negotiations for climate markets in the context of Paris? How can technologies like Hyperledger, uh, particularly the use of decentralized identifiers and verifiable credentials and trusted ledgers can help in the mechanism of preventing double counting in uh, climate markets? And that is still under negotiation. So it's very important that from the technology, open source technology world, we get to the United Nations, the Conference of the Parties to inform uh, the capabilities that we that we have. So one of the demos that we'll prototype that we will showcase at the end of this, um, and and we'll point to a video that we'll talk through is is actually to look at the North America as a, as a blueprint of how we could address some of these issues globally. And let's just say something as simple as a renewable energy project that produces, of course, clean megawatt hours. That gets straight translated into a renewable energy certificate, an asset that says one megawatt hour of clean energy was produced. And that's a sign to someone 
but you can have buyers. In fact, there's regulation to require certain utilities that have to have a certain amount of RECs. Now, what happens within a North American context of markets and how they are laid out when you've got buyers and sellers in different markets? So what we'll showcase in terms of nested accounting is that by, by creating robust assetization of a, a unit, let's say a renewable energy certificate and, and also the associated carbon, attach it to a geofence region, let's say a subnational region, um, it could allow that if you move between one market to the other, uh, then you would have to create uh, what are called the corresponding adjustments at the inventory of each jurisdiction. It, and it could help between uh, states within the US or regions within the uh, North American market, but it also, the same architecture would work internationally. Um, so hopefully that's a good, good background explanation of what we are um, exploring and the different applications. Uh, and so because I talked about jurisdictions and geofence regions, I'm going to pass it along to David to give an introduction of the concept of the spatial web. Uh, I'll stop sharing and maybe David, you have more agency to, to do it on your end. Yes. Uh, Feel free as, as we're doing that, that if you have questions or thoughts, go into the session tab, put Q&A and you can drop thoughts in there and we can uh, address them as we go or, or, or pick them up at the end. Beautiful. Uh, thank you, Martine. Uh, so I'm just going to give a little bit of high-level framing on the spatial web, uh, web 3.0, if, if you will, and uh, just provide a little bit of background context on these core standards that we're working with the IEEE on, and then we'll bring that back to how we can apply these standards, hopefully, to address our planetary uh, civilizational level challenge of uh, uh, climate change. So there are three core uh, standard specifications that we're working with the IEEE on. One is for hyperspatial domains, which is key to the jurisdictional nested accounting and understanding of you know, various different boundaries related to markets and, and regions inside a particular territory that's accounting. The hyperspatial transaction protocol and the hyperspatial modeling language that I'll, that I'll speak about just for some high level framing. So really quickly, um, the point of what we're trying to accomplish with the spatial web, it's really in fact, a hyperspatial web. And what we mean by that is it's connecting spatial, semantic, and societal data contexts and mapping the relationships between them so that we get a coherent view of context for every interaction in the real world. It's really about creating a cybernetic feedback loop between the digital and, and the physical uh, realities. This is the, uh, very quickly, the hyperspatial modeling language. This is also part of the IEEE uh, standards work. And this is not a canonical data format or model as much as it is a, uh, an activity uh, uh, modeling language that allows you to color, uh, mathematically color data, data streams for, for AI particularly to be able to infer from data streams context at, at a much higher degree of precision. So we say some user, some actor by virtue of some authority within some hyperspatial domain has a right based on credentials, which are uh, in the form of, in, in our case, in, in implementing with hyperspatial, uh, sorry, Hyperledger Indian Aries, um, to perform a claim on an activity. And all of the transaction streams, which is an activity state change, are then stored in a graph structure, which we refer to as a context graph. These context elements, and by virtue of storing every transaction, every activity state change with this very rich uh, uh, coloring language, we can be able to trust data across contexts and be able to transfer workflows and accounting methodologies across contexts much more efficiently. So once the, the data is in that graph format, we can now query with the hyperspatial transaction protocol in any dimension or across dimensions by ranges. So temperature uh, uh, over time, air particulate count, soil conditions, um, every asset gets, gets registered and we're constantly enriching context around that asset by creating essentially uh, smart contracts but that are, uh, can ex extend to other dimensions. So you can have either a prescriptive or restrictive contract related to orchestrating real world interactions. You know, and 
to define clean air, it, it means X, Y, Z as far as CO, you know, uh, the, the content of that air that then is uh, reinforced by uh, all the sensoria that are then uh, signing uh, 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 verifiable credential transactions. So finally, all this goes into <clears throat> essentially a volumetric extension of uh, hyperdimensional extension, multidimensional extension, sorry, of the virtual, the concept of a virtual domain. So now you can say, for this plot of land, you know, who can, who can uh, uh, you know, plant, who can uh, collect, who can sequester, who can um, act. So we've been working very closely with the Open Earth Foundation and the Yale Open Innovation Lab to apply these technologies first and foremost to this, this critical challenge that, that we have in front of us. And so we've done a number of prototypes of both um, verifiable credentials as well as something we call dynamic adaptable schemas related to interoperability of all these data that are used uh, for climate accounting. So there's a um, hour and a half long uh, video, if you run out of NyQuil someday, um, of the full demo that we did a, short, uh, a few months ago as a result of a year plus of R&D work. So I, I encourage anyone to check that out. Um, but we'll go through a little bit of that at a high level uh, here today as well. So in this prototype, we're using a graph database. Um, these are just reference implementations, Hyperledger Indian Aries for all the DID and credential issuances, and um, simple document storage. Um, we're using DID and verifiable credentials, DIDs really throughout for everything. Every asset gets a DID, every, every, um, <clears throat> every uh, you know, basically identity is, is a DID in the system. In the graph, it's just a sea of DIDs, in essence, in the context graph. But one of the things we're doing is we take schemas and we uh, deconstruct them into a series of connected nodes in the graph so that you can link um, any data and any schema to every single interaction in the real world and transaction in the real world. And that basically ensures that you don't lose context. Uh, as I was saying, every actor, domain, and asset has a decentralized identifier. Um, and all of these are represented as verifiable credentials that then are used in proofs and um, spatial contracts related to, is it okay, for example, to transfer this rec from one area to another? We evaluate that as a, a hyperspatial transaction using the, the hyperspatial modeling language. <clears throat> all, as I said before, all, this, all the schemas are linked, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more in terms of the power of that. But really this kind of uh, speaks to the fact that we have many different registries with lots of different data schemas for representing the same type of information and we need to be able to normalize those together in, a, in an extremely efficient manner so that when we're doing the uh, Paris global stock take uh, starting in uh, 2023, you know, ultimately we want this to be a, a real-time accounting uh, where you know, the, the national inventories are rolled up in, in real time from all the the subdomains that that um, that they that they reference, rather than a long, multi multi year process of of combining spreadsheets together. Um, <clears throat> all of the conditions of the contract get inherited, and this is where you allow um, allows you to express policy in, in a spatial manner. Um, we're also working with the European Commission to develop the drone standards for the EU, including all the monitoring, reporting, and verification actions related to any drone. So um, this is an example of where you can extend um, hyperspatial contracts beyond just the accounting into the actual monitoring. So it's Martin who can speak to um, some of the functional aspects of, of the demo that we delivered and the, the relevancy. Go ahead. Great, thank you, uh, David. I hope everyone's still sort of uh, following along. I um, I uh, put the the URL of the YouTube uh, where you could also watch uh, later in depth in the demo. Uh, that was done in the context of another event, and we thought it was very important to be able to share it here in the Hyperledger Global Forum. Um, so, uh, and then you can also see the slides as we as we go if you want to check them out later. So uh, the, the first sort of demo that happened a couple of uh, years ago or one year ago uh, is, okay, when I talk about renewable energy certificates, assetizing that, that certificate is very relevant. So if you have, for example, 
uh, a solar farm and you want to prove that an electric vehicle charger uh, is charged through uh, renewable energy, otherwise, why would you have an EV that's using coal-based uh, electricity? That is a, um, a challenge in and of itself because the certification of renewable often comes in aliquots of one megawatt hour. So one rec is one megawatt hour, but what you're going to be using is going to be at the kilowatt hour level. So we have to fractionalize that certification. And you know, also need to be able to have a traceability of that, where it came from, when, how it was purchased. And in some sense, the EV then has to have a wallet of all those, not just electrons, but a history of data packages of where that come from. And so with that, we worked very closely with the organization called ClearTrace. They specifically do that, use uh, IoT integration and create immutable data records based on that so that uh, it can establish rich, rich attributes. So almost every reading of a smart meter, smart meter at the uh, renewable energy site, but also smart meter at the, let's say Tesla supercharger are also recorded and reconciled so that would we can get to what's what's called in the renewable energy space a load following matching. Um, and uh, if, if we think about that from the semantics, a lot of what uh, David was chatting about here is a bit of how to create a very rich spatial context um, and leveraging DIDs and verified credentials, an amazingly exciting uh, space, but the semantic part's very important. So who, what, where, when, how becomes very important. The contract between uh, an electric vehicle that says, I want to source renewable energy, well, has to be able to create a, a fully um, uh, semantically logical uh, context for that. So this is an, a good example. In this case, the, the power uh, utility is Avangrid um, in, in Connecticut, uh, produces a solar energy that was financed by XYZ that has a device that at a certain point in time produces that electricity that's verified that it is, it is indeed renewable and that it was produced, that it displaced carbon, that gets associated to a certificate. That also is approved by normally the registry, the regional registry that manages in, uh, electricity. And uh, then you've got your um, Tesla charge station, which is a different domain. So this might be in a totally different space than this. Um, and in fact, that might be very relevant if you are, uh, let's say in California, trying to buy electrons that were put into the system in North Dakota, uh, the offsetting capability of that might be lower than the ones that are regional. Um, and, and why? Because you really want to account the right as a consumer to do that. So that's, that's the, the example of, of, of that semantics. And then we go even into higher levels of complexity. So if we, if we read that semantics from the left, Avangrid, which is the utility by authorization of the asset manager and the sustainability director of the company, but also the Ministry of Environment of North Dakota, transfers. This is this is in the case of a wind farm within one um, a wind farm that's owned by this company, Avangrid, that is in within this spatial domain, North Dakota. So this is very much Venn diagrams that are also nested, um, all within Earth. And so these are the type of semantics applied to the type of credential users, authorities, assets. Um, um, so uh, transfers mitigation outcomes to uh, Tesla Motor from California who receives these, these assets and are also approved by Ministry of Environment. Why, let's follow this just real quick to understand why a Ministry of Environment becomes important. So now we have an asset which is wind, it creates as an activity, electricity gets converted into a renewable energy certificate, a mitigation outcome, um, has to be verified by, for example, ClearTrace or Switch that says, yes, this was indeed created. Um, that gets moved into a registry. It's authorized, for example, by a Ministry of Environment of North Dakota that that asset can leave the territory. If, if, if a Ministry of Environment does not allow that, and it, in different jurisdictions, it could be different entities, does not allow that, uh, then that should not be able to move. So a buyer should not be able to buy it. But, if, but what does it mean that it allows it? Because once you move that asset from one territory to another, um, what it needs to happen is that the inventory of North Dakota has to lose that mitigation outcome and move it into the inventory of the recipient. So essentially, it's not just a transaction between Avangrid and Tesla. It's a transaction between North Dakota and California it needs to be properly represented in their inventories. From the United States standpoint, which is the broader box here, 
nothing happened, right? All these assets still move within the U.S. Um, uh, let's say management in the which which often at the inventory is managed by the Environmental Protection Agency. And again, obviously, all is within Earth. And who is the authority dealing with climate accounting? Ideally, is UNFCCC and Paris Agreement. So these are the type of situations that we set out to try to do. Highly complex, but then it, it's it's the next 30 years are going to see a lot of this happening. So uh, we got to explore what are the different components from a technological standpoint that can help us do that. Um, so again, you'll be able to see this uh, in the video that I, that I posted. Feel free as we move along to post, uh, post some Q and A's. Um, and um, let me just show you a little bit of what this looked like. Um, we, we, we demoed in each jurisdiction a level of a carbon balance. Uh, white being a zero balance and blue a little bit of a positive balance so net mitigation and red um and so we started playing around with this so that so that we really test that an asset which is like let's say a power plant in georgia uh, affects the carbon rating of that state um these are examples of how these conversions occur from one rec to a to a, a climate action asset um I hope that we have time. David can talk a bit about the how you create a homogenizable sort of assets. Um, these get registered so that you'd be able to follow a bit of what I showed before. What price the certificate has? Uh, then you've got the purchaser. The purchaser has a wallet of credentials, and these get moved along. And once it's retired, it means that it, it cannot be traded anymore. And so that should be also um, a contract in and of itself. Often, when when with tokenized carbon offsets. In, uh, in the normal so the Ethereum world, these are burnt uh, so that they can't be traded again. Um, so I'd really encourage, uh, oh, this is a different sort of uh, YouTube video that I'll, I'll also put, um, put the content there. Um, and there's some exciting points. Maybe David, you can just unmute yourself and talk a little bit through it. I'm gonna read uh, one of the Q and A's um, and as you're walking through it, then we'll, we'll be able to address the, the Q and A. Let me see if uh, this is probably a slide that you can talk a little bit to. Sure. Um, yeah, the question uh, from Will Abramson was how many areas agents are used and what do they represent? Can you go? Yes. Um, how are these the IDs assigned and who controls the keys? So um, at, at the highest level um, today, at the very least, every authority that is responsible for specific domains would have uh, presumably have its own agent, uh, as well as ultimately every actor that, that participates. So. Um, if, uh, you know, if, if, um, you basically have, um, you need, you need, you know, at the end of the day, I think what will eventually happen, we hope is that every single citizen in the world being a stakeholder in this would ultimately get their own, um, you know, uh, identity with respect to how they are, are participating in, in, you know, various different ways that they roll up their activities, whether they're a part of a, a company or a city um, or otherwise, they're ultimately citizens. So um, today it's really individual authorities uh, in their own ex execution context would be the issuers of these credentials and signers of, of the transactions. And, um, and yeah, yeah. And, and, and it really depends. It's not like a, a single point. So we one would expect that, let's say the United States issues uh, a, a climate credential to California, California, can issue that credential to Tesla. Um, within, let's say, Avangrid, they have to also issue the, the asset, but that needs to be verified by others. Um, and this is this is the where this kind of interfaces with government technology, it's where it becomes really exciting because you've got private actors issuing DIDs and verifiable credentials, and you've got government issuing those to, um, to companies. We probably have, ideally, some folks in the room from British Columbia, they're definitely the leaders in, in the space. Um, um, but it's, it's a lot of that, that relationship between not just one single issuer, but, but the relationship, uh, and maybe David, if you want to talk a bit about dynamic adaptable tunes, otherwise we have some interesting sort of, uh, cue. Yeah, I'll just, do, just to get through it, I'll just say a couple, uh, things at a very high level. Um, I know there's, uh, uh, some work also going on in the trust IP foundation, you know, around schema management and. This is extremely important for climate accounting. In the instance here, we have three different registries, kind of the primary registries. And, you know, these are really representing the same types of projects, um, wind projects, you know, uh, land-based mitigation um, uh, projects. But, you know, they have different field names and things like that. And on, on the one hand, 
Um, they're just simple, in some cases, field mapping, but on the other, it creates inordinate amounts of um, uncertainty and risk and, and data uh, transfer and, and cleanliness issues. So we're working very hard on being able to anchor specific projects in their spatial and semantic context. And so over time, we sort of start to develop neural, neural pathways almost uh, with respect to how to trans, translate between different data schemas so that as we onboard new projects, new environmental projects, we can um, uh, leverage that. So let me see if we have a couple. I, I realize we just ran out of time. This is, yeah. sorry we got carried away. There's some really important Q and A's here. So I would encourage people to uh, write us. I'm gonna put our emails here so that we can continue the conversation. If you are interested in learning more about this and some of the exciting projects coming along. Um, thank you, James, for facilitating. Uh, I hope that was enlightening. There's a lot to unpack there. So uh, it's, it's fine that there's a, a couple of things that we didn't go a little bit deeper into, but uh, we'd be very, very excited to reach out to anyone with further questions. And David is David. Yeah, I can, you know, if, I don't know if we're supposed to hard stop, I can try to answer a couple of the, the questions. Um, yeah, assets are represented as verifiable credentials. Um, ultimately, every data stream can be converted as we imagine. Every transaction can be converted into a verifiable credential and reused to prove some context. So um, issuing uh, renewable uh, you know, green electrons in one context you know, becomes a credential that then can be used um, when it's converted into a mitigation outcome and then eventually retired. Um, so this looks pretty complicated, a lot of change. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> climate accounting is not a, not a simple subject to begin with, um, but it's so critically important. And um, the, the, the key here of what we're trying to do is we're trying to meet the world where it is uh, with respect to the the state of the art in, in climate accounting, but we're really trying to, um, you know, get it much closer, as I as I mentioned, to, to real time or or you know, speed of light as close as we can we can get. And um, we need, you know, we're one human family. We have one budget uh, for our our carbon that we can emit and that we have to sequester, and we don't really have a QuickBooks uh, to to track all of this. And um, at a at a higher level, when when the initially when the financial markets had all these reporting public reporting requirements we thought that this was just outrageous how can these companies you know uh, report on all their revenue it's going to cause all kinds of extraordinary complications it's so much change and there was but now we just accept this as as um a required part of doing business and i would say i would go so far as to suggest that ultimately environmental accounting and financial accounting really need to start to merge. We need to do accounting the way that nature accounts for things, which is really at a molecular level. And um, we need to have our policies that are really informed by, are we actually doing good? Are these actions really being impactful? And if we don't have another 10 years really to go through um, you know, a bunch of hand waving and you know, people comparing apples to, to oranges, so to speak. And uh, to answer one of the questions, I know we have two more minutes that are a little bit of extra time um, implemented in practice. So the, the leveraging the ideas and credentials are already uh, implemented in practice in different cases. And the case of, for example, British Columbia, that, that's already in practice and, and our role is to collaborate as much as possible with, with BC to be able to take a lot of these lessons learned and, and try to think about how this would be rolled out also since you already kind of have some infrastructure on DIDs and VCs. Um, and, and then there's a lot of moving parts. Actually, great question of how many ARIES agents were deployed in that. I think we would have to go back and count them, but there was definitely more than, more than, more than one. Um, and it's just a question of like structuring architecturally in a way that you can have a lot, but it probably starts making no sense for a human, but it starts making more sense for AI. Um, uh, with that, unless there's anything else, thank you so much for joining. Uh, hopefully it's helpful that, that we put the YouTube to learn more, the, um, the, the deck that we just showed, and our email for uh, any follow-ups.